Welcome to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. Here, I interview brain scientists and discuss their work, as well as the latest advances and challenges in the field of brain mapping. Today, Dr. Jeff Binder is my guest. He's a neurologist and a very active fMRI pioneer and practitioner. He's been doing this for at least 30 years. He's currently professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Neurology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. In 1980, he received his bachelor's in music from the University of Nebraska. In 1981, he did graduate studies actually at the Michigan State University, but in 1986, he got his MD from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. From 86 to 92, he uh, did a number of, of residencies at Northwestern University in Chicago, at the Neurologic Institute of New York Presbyterian Hospital, and uh, he finally was a fellow uh, at the Neurological Institute of uh, New York and Presbyterian Hospital. And he moved to MCW in about 1993 when fMRI was beginning there. So Jeff's research focuses on neural systems underlying human language processing and concept representation, speech perception, reading, and aphasia. Much of his work is based on fMRI measurements in healthy people combined with psycholinguistic and psychophysical measurements of behavior. His clinical practice focuses on patients with aphasia, and he studies the pathological correlates of specific language deficits in these patients using voxel-based lesion symptom mapping, as well as fMRI. He's also worked extensively on applications of fMRI for pre-surgical mapping, uh, including development and validation of fMRI language lateralization methods and prediction of language and verbal memory outcomes. This was a really fun conversation that ran the gamut of how he delved into research, uh, some early days of fMRI stories, his novel insights into the idea uh, of experiential-based concept representation in the brain, and how that fits in to our idea of the default mode network. We also talk about uh, clinical applications of fMRI and how it's being used now, how it might be used in the future. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Dr. Jeff Binder, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me and uh, with OHBM Neurosalience Podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. All right. Well, well, good, good. It's an um, honor and a delight to be here. Well, it's good to see you. I mean, I've <clears throat> I've known you for oh wow over thirty, 30 years now, mm-hmm. and uh, working with you in the in the very early days, and and you know. We'll get into talking a little bit about that, but um, uh, yeah, and it's always great to see you. It's great to see you've been really, you know, your productivity has continued and, and uh, the work has continued and MCW has been doing well as well. So that's good. Well, that's um, great to see you. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks. So, so I just want to start off at the, at the very beginning. I was looking at your, um, uh, your CV or your background and it, and, you know, it looks, looks like you had a degree in music. And did. how did you decide to, you know, go from music to um, medical school? Uh, how did that, I mean, what, what was that transition like? You must have been, you, you must play a number of instruments then if you have a degree in music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was mainly at that time a flutist, but uh, my first instrument was guitar. And that's the one that I've sort of stuck with over the years. Still, still play quite a, quite a bit. And my wife is a musician, which makes it nice. We, we play together in a... Oh, that's great. Brazilian jazz trio. Oh. Um, yeah, well, I get this, I get asked this question a lot, and I don't think, I don't think it's that unusual of a story. Um, you fall in love with music at a young age, which was a little surprising for me because I don't come from a musical family. Nobody in my family was a musician or played. Um, but it hit me hard when I was a teenager and a young adolescent. Um, 
and I that's what I wanted to do. You know, I was always always very interested in the brain too. Um, I can remember even in high school, you know, reading books on philosophy about the mind brain problem. And I was really, really fascinated with that stuff too. But when college time came around, it was uh, actually, I, I remember touring around some, some universities and looking at uh, pre-med programs. Uh, it was obviously what my family would have preferred that I do, <laughs> especially <laughs> with my dad. You know, my, my family is not, uh, they're not academics at all. My parents, I think, were the first ones in the lineage to ever get a college degree. So it wasn't an academic family at all, but uh, they sent me around to a few schools. I remember looking at Northwestern's combined MD-PhD program and getting accepted to it, actually. And huh. uh, at the last minute, um, I broke it to my parents. Uh, I sort of came out as a musician, you know. I broke it, <laughs> broke it to them that, that that was that was what I had to do for now, and so uh, it was great. I mean, uh, I learned a lot in music school, and uh, I guess one way to look at it is that I satisfied the the the, the bug, scratched the itch, um, found out that. Uh, the world of classical music is extremely competitive. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the example I always give is one time I heard about uh, a chair opening for a, for a flutist in a major symphony orchestra. And uh, they have like, they had like 300 people come and audition for one chair. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like that. Um, I was, as, as most students do at that stage in their career, I was practicing five, six hours a day. Wow. Um, wow. And that's kind of, that's par for the course. And then I sort of realized that this is a very, very difficult proposition. Um, it's, uh, it's requires such discipline. I mean, I joke to people that music school was much harder than medical school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it kind of was um, to get ready for your, you know, qualifying recitals and all that stuff. Ah, I yeah. still remember it. But the one thing it did teach me was, you know, stamina, discipline. Uh, if you do have to pull up all nighter to get something done, you, it's not that big of a deal. And, you know, medical school is a lot of that. You just, you, you, the exams come up on a monthly basis and you cram for them for two nights in a row and stay up all night and memorize useless facts that you'll never retain <laughs> and enough to pass the exam and then you go through the cycle again and again yeah. um but the actually the discipline i got in music helped me through that and that's that's not a that's not a novel story. I mean, I think a lot of people go through that. So one of the reasons I decided to switch careers, which was a gradual process over a couple of years, I actually went to graduate school briefly in, in music as well to study composition, actually. Oh. Um, it was it was during that process that I kind of uh, changed course. But what one of the reasons was just realizing what a difficult life it is to be a musician. And I, you know, Props to all those people who managed to do it and uh, do it well. It's just, it's, it's an amazing thing to behold. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question about that, though. Do you think that at the highest levels, it's a, you know, like, like anything, though, it's a little bit of luck? And, or did you realize, oh, my talent only goes this far? And yeah. uh, um, I think it depends on the field of music you're in. In classical music, it's not that much about luck. It's yeah. about skill. And, uh, you know, uh, not just technical skill, but uh, interpretation skill. But in pop music, it's more about luck for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. uh, and, and about creativity. Yep. Classical yep. music is not so much about creativity. But the other reason I think that I decided to change course was I didn't feel like devoting my life to music was going to have that much of a big impact on society. I mean, it's musicians talk a lot about and people talk a lot about how music uh, can change people's lives and can have a big impact on their life. Um, I, I guess I wanted to 
have a more concrete impact. And so my second love, which has become by far my first love, um, was uh, studying the brain. And, you know, it, that I'll go back to the fact that I don't come from an academic family. The, norm, the normal thing to do, the best thing to do would have been to go after a PhD in neuroscience. Yeah. But when I uh, was a, you know, young graduate student in my 20s, early 20s, I, I didn't even know about uh, studying neuroscience. I mean, that was not something that I was aware of. In my family, my background, if you wanted to study the brain, you went to medical school. And yeah. So that's what I did. And I always knew that neurology was what I wanted to do, you know, from day one, unlike almost all my peers who they go to medical school and they might have an idea about a vague idea about, oh, I want to you know, study the heart or something like that. But I, ha I had a very clear idea about what I wanted to do in medical school. I wanted to be a neurologist. And so that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and not psychiatry or anything like that. It was mostly about wanted it. to base it on the brain itself as far as, uh, yeah. Psychiatry was a second choice for sure. It was really fascinating. Uh, area. And I had a, remember, I had some great instructors in psychiatry at, at, during medical school. And so several of my best friends went into psychiatry. And it was a, it was a poll, but yeah, it's a neurology for me, more yeah. of a concrete guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, sort of tangentially, but not uh, completely relevant to, to, to what you're saying about music. I, in some level, I, I think about this a, a lot with with running, for instance. I, you know, I was a successful runner in college, and and I, but not good enough to be in the realm of like running mm -hmm. professionally, but but just under that. And mm -hmm. but then I thought, oh, the professional runners, you know, old, you know, but a, the life of a professional runner, just right. like a musician, like is, a dancer or something. Yeah, yeah, it's so Over difficult. Over by twenty eight or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah it's so stratified it's so hard it's too bad because you know it, it, in some ways it would be great to have a society that sort of more uh gets into that and and mm -hmm. you know fosters that but but either way yeah. yep. um, okay so 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 you got your degree in neurology and uh uh you did some residencies uh but then then you i i you know it's it's interesting i i remember I remember the the early time when you arrived at maybe not when you arrived at MCW, but when fMRI was kind of getting going, and and I remember being uh, uh, extremely impressed with <laughs> uh, more than with anyone. I mean, they're all great, um, but you actually, you know, right away uh, were thinking of you know very carefully about paradigms. You took the reins. You you just you, you just like dove into it and were extremely serious and extremely um, focused on, on, on really making this work at a very early time. Uh, uh, and I think that, you know, as we go along here, I think I've always, I, I've always been impressed with, uh, with how you merge your, your questions to paradigm design and interpretation, because I think, I think you do that, uh, uh, among the best in the field, in my opinion, and so I, it would be really interesting to talk about. I mean, mm -hmm. what you what you've done even recently is really an interesting sort of fruition of, of that sort of effort as well. But but you want to talk a little bit about the early days when you first arrived? What mm -hmm. you know? I think that you were at MCW, but then suddenly you just started getting into research, and and that's mm -hmm. kind of unusual in mm -hmm. some regard. Um, yeah. uh, how did you just? jump into that <laughs> how did you have time yeah. because you had a practice so <laughs> right right no it's a good question and it's really difficult for young doctors to do that um so you do get a chance to as a, as a physician in training you get a chance to get your feet wet in research and um you can do a little bit of it during medical school but um and residency not so much because the residency is where you learn the medical trade that you've selected. And so it's very hands-on, very full-time. But uh, we have postdocs in medicine. So after you do your residency, usually you do a postdoctoral, they call it a fellowship. Um, it's, and some of them are 100% uh, clinical. You're, you're just in clinic all the time. But I selected one 
on purpose that would allow me some time to do research. So my, my two year fellowship, which, which was at Columbia University with a guy named JP Moore, um, was more than half of the time research. Hmm. So he made, he created an opportunity for me to uh, enroll patients in behavioral research studies. And these were mostly patients with reading disorders because that's, I just, I just decided to focus on that. Um, so patients with uh, what we now call VWFA or visual word form area lesions and the syndrome called uh, peripheral alexia, pure alexia, letter by letter reading, whatever you want, verbal alexia, it's got about five different names. Um, <clears throat> so I, I made that a focus of my fellowship for two years and uh, published a couple papers on that topic and got really fascinated by how brain damage can affect people's perception and especially language and uh, yeah, I also did a study on, on the neglect syndrome, the left hemi neglect syndrome. Um, yeah, and so by the time I got done with my fellowship, I'd gotten, it, it's, it, it was an amazing learning experience because when I started the fellowship, I didn't even know what a p-value was. You know, I, didn't, <laughs> I, didn't even, I had no stats training at all and sort of taught myself that um, I remember reading the the primer on statistics and going oh wow you can calculate the reliability of a difference and that's how you do it and I you know it's eye-opening but by the time I <laughs> got done with those two years and I published three four papers and uh, had the research bug definitely bit me up. By the time I got done with the fellowship, I was really, that was my, that was my goal. And so <clears throat> I interviewed at MCW after looking at a lot of other jobs. That, that was a, that was a, obviously a pivotal decision in my, my life. You know, wh where, where do you, what do you do after you finish your training? Um, and uh, I would not have been at MCW, M MCW neurology department advertised for a stroke doctor. So they wanted somebody to build a stroke program. And that's why they were interested in me. But I was interested in MCW for a completely different reason. I, I saw your movie of the motor cortex, you know, switching sides. This is what showed <laughs> that to me on my visit. And you have to, you have to um, put your mind frame back in 1992, I think it was when this all happened, early 1992, um, when the when my uh, interviewing process started. And uh, what was available out there was PET, obviously. Um, yeah. And we didn't, we didn't have PET at Columbia. Um, so I looked jealously at places like UCLA and London and, you know, WashU yeah. that were doing really this interesting brain mapping stuff. And yeah. I was doing sort of brain mapping using lesion symptom mapping, but yes, brain mapping with activation tasks. Wow. <laughs> that just sounded amazing to me. And and you know, the potential was pretty obvious from the beginning. If you if you can see the the motor cortex light up when somebody taps their fingers almost in real time, you know, much more close to real time than, than Pat. Um, that was so tremendously exciting and the possibilities. I mean, all, all you have to do is put somebody in the scanner and see if you can light up their Heschel's gyrus, right? Yep. With some sounds and, uh, oh, it, it, I remember when I first came and started working with Steve Rayo, shout out to Steve, who was sort of my mentor early on at MCW, we actually wrote an R01 proposal together that didn't get funded uh, like before the PPG. Yeah. But Steve, you know, I, he, I, I feel about him a lot like you feel about Eric. He, he guided me and uh, showed me the ropes around MCW and we worked hard together on developing experiments and uh, a lot of that was his input to so yeah I, I mean I, I want to I don't want to sound falsely modest because frankly I think I, I made the best of a 
golden opportunity that I was handed. But I also want to say that a lot of my career has benefited from people I've worked with and, you know, uh, some now that I'm working with who are much smarter than I am and are carrying on this very high level interesting stuff that we've been doing lately. Yeah. Which I'm, I'm sort of supervising and directing at a high level, but you know, I, it, the work would not get done without, it's, it's like, I, I imagine it's a little bit like you and Nick at Krieges Court. Um, yep. people, people like that who come exactly. up with creative ideas and uh, you benefit from them. Uh, you, meaning me, I benefit from them and they're invaluable. I mean, it's just uh, collaborations are invaluable. And, and I've always tried to surround myself with people who are smarter than me, which yep. hasn't been too hard, actually. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so anyway, back to 1992, um, yeah, just the, the fMRI just opened up this world of possibilities. As you recall, that was a pretty exciting time at MCW. Yes. Everybody was working overtime to try to use that scanner, which was free to use, which was great. Yeah. Um, to the utmost, and we didn't know what we were doing, you know? Yeah. When we first started doing auditory experiments, we didn't even have an auditory system. Yep. So uh, Steve and I went to, you know, Home Depot or somewhere and got some PVC tubes. And, you know, we got 20 feet of a PVC tube that ran all the way from the patch bay on the scanner control room to the subject's head. And it was such <laughs> a weird device. And I remember <laughs> we, wanted, we wanted them to be able to respond to tasks, you know, to trials. So we rigged up this string that they would pull, literally <laughs> a piece of string that ran all the way from the control room and it would it would make contact with a with a buzzer that we could hear in the control room. That was yeah. our, that was our response box. Yes. So but anyway, I mean the scanner was there, the the possibilities were endless. And uh, I I can proudly say at this point in time that we dove into it like madmen. We were, yeah. you, you remember, we scanned until three, four in the morning. Yes. Yeah. I was scanning till three. Everyone was there. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful sense of community. And it was great because as important as things like, you know, having, uh, you know, set protocols and paying for scan time and everything is important there. It was like free, you know, Jim Hyde negotiated with radiology and just, you know, they just allowed us to play with the scanner all night. So it was great. Yeah, I remember those early days where where I was, I remember every once in a while, I, I think I volunteered for your study. I remember you you know, at some point in advance where you had like a microphone or, you know, you would talk, you know, in real time in the scanner. But I also remember, I just remember thinking, oh, his, you know, his paradigms, I mean, you're very, very, even early on, it was very, um, very specific questions you were asking. It wasn't just like, let's see what lights up. Um, and I remember having to hold in, you know, a sense of laughter during the scan because I would be hearing, you know, nonsense words, words, and then interspersed with like white noise, like, ch -ch 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 you know, borp, yeep, yoop, ch -ch -ch. And, and I was like, you know, at some point you're like, I'm probably confounding the data with, you know, the laugh suppression uh, uh, area. <laughs> that was, that was, you know, that was an interesting study because you're right, that was, uh, you're describing one of our first auditory experiments because that was an area that I didn't have a lot of background in. So I, I quickly taught myself a lot about speech perception, phoneme perception. But that was an area that seemed to me to be, I mean, despite all the noise that the scanner makes, which yep. I think, you know, I encountered people in those early days who said, oh, you can't, you can't study the auditory cortex because the machine is making so much noise. And you, you did a nice study on that topic too. But we, we thought we'd try it anyway. I mean, the scanner noise was a, was a constant, right? So if you add in some sounds over and above that of different types, maybe you can get differential responses. And mm -hmm. We had, you know, not not very strong hypotheses, but the idea was that if you compare pseudo words to tones, maybe you'll get some areas of the cortex that process higher complexity spectrotemporal patterns. And if you compare words to uh, pseudo words, uh, maybe you'll get some lexical semantics, et cetera. Yeah. That turned out not to be the case, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that those data sat around. I mean, we collected the data probably from ninety four to ninety six or seven, something like that. Scanned about thirty. I think it was about thirty patients, and 
wrote up some early stuff, but um, yeah, later on um, we published that I think in 2000 in Cerebral Cortex and it's became a very widely cited paper. And I, the takeaway I, I took from it was that uh, there was a pretty clear sort of hierarchical stream that was coming down from Heschel's gyrus toward the superior temporal sulcus and, you know, tones greater than noise, tones greater than noise, speech patterns greater than tones. And um, it wasn't unexpected, wasn't earth shaking, but it kind of demonstrated for us what you could do with fMRI and look at relative left, right lateralization of each of those step stages. And, you know, it, it related well to what we knew about lesions in that area causing pure phoneme deafness, I call it. And yeah. uh, so you're probably in that 2000 amp. <laughs> I, okay. I, I remember. Right. I mean, your name, you're definitely in our fMRI data bank. Yeah. You yeah. Online, you can type in Banditini and you'll come up. <laughs> we we that, that's, have data on how much you were smoking back then. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I don't mean to bail, uh, violate any HIPAA rules here, but you know, <laughs> one of the questions we ask, one of the many questions we've always asked patient, patients is how much they smoke and drink and all that stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never know how that data could be useful later on to re regroup it in terms of, you know, yeah. lifestyle choices or whatever, like, like this done in the big bio, bio bank. But actually just a tangent on that. Um, it just reminds me that that you actually, I mean, early on, you know, when subject people were just collecting 10 subjects for a study, I remember back then you had you collected a you had a database of like 120 subjects, I think. And that was the first, I think that was one of the first big data <laughs> oh, uh, repositories. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. They're probably thinking of maybe the Springer et al. paper, which had uh, I want to say a hundred epilepsy. Yeah, yeah, in the order of a hundred at least. Yeah. And that was considered huge. Yeah. And and we were just super looking powerful. At language lateralization, basically. Yeah. 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 Um, yep. And that that study uh, and many others that I published in the epilepsy pre-surgical mapping field, I should call it, um, uses a uh, task activation paradigm that I have to give a shout out to a guy named Jean-Francois Demonet, who kind of invented it and published a paper in Brain, I think in 92. So right when I was starting all this that had a huge influence on my thinking and yeah. Okay, so over the years, and, and we'll, we'll get into talking about some of your more recent papers, but what I've always found, once again, nice about your, your paradigms is that they were, you know, they had, they had hypotheses that were, you know, testable and, th and things that were falsifiable. And, and you, there was real sense of progress with your work as far as that's concerned. Has there been, um, over the years, as you have been building these ever more sophisticated experiments, and I actually have to agree with you that, um, yeah, surrounding yourself by, by smart people, I've been, you know, luckily, it seems like as the field progresses, the amount of sophistication that has to go into analysis is, is huge, and it's hard for the PI. I feel like I'm just kind of like giving suggestions and things like that, but then it's the people that are really doing a lot of the analysis and everything. But but once again, as you as you progressed along, have there been any, you know, things that you thought were true that you had to to revise um, significantly in terms of either the language system? And we'll get into you know the sem semantic and uh, uh, systems as well. But it seems like you've worked up from uh, sound structure to language to concept forming, and and it, and has there been had have, have there been results that you've seen that have changed your previous hunches as to how things are organized as far as that's concerned? Yep, quite a few. Well, let me start with probably the biggest one, which I, I think is illustrative of how far my field has come in the last 30 years, which is really, really far. But this, this is one example of that. Um, and it's and it's called Wernicke's area. Everybody's heard of it. Um, whatever Wernicke's area really is, and whatever it really should be, um, when the fMRI uh, revolution happened, can we call it that the fMRI revolution. Yeah, I like it. Neuro I like it. Revolution. <laughs> um, before it happened, 
generations of neuroscientists, especially clinical neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, but you know, even even cognitive neuroscientists uh, had been taught that you know this area in the back of the superior temporal lobe, um, especially the superior temporal gyrus, the, the gyrus on top, and the parietal cortex maybe right next to it. Uh, some people call it TPJ, but it's actually the supermarginal gyrus, um, was labeled Wernicke's area. And that label carried with it an implication. Well, no, the claim was that that was the area of the brain that did, did language comprehension, right? Yeah. Um, you know, all of your, all of your knowledge about speech and what words mean and all that stuff was all in that little tiny region, <laughs> region of the brain. But, you know, it's preposterous almost to think about now, but uh, I have to tell you that during my training and, you know, generations before me and uh, most neurologists and neurosurgeons at the time fMRI came out, that was their picture of language comprehension in the brain. It all yeah. occurred in that little zone in the back of the sylvian fissure. Man, that, that's just changed radically. Um, you know, now we know that, uh, and, and this, you know, that, that, that picture of, of Wernicke's area was not what Wernicke said. So if you go back to his original papers, that it, it's not at all what he said. He thought that that region of the brain was uh, involved in just more of the sensory perceptual processing of speech sounds and, ah. um, and also internal um, images of speech sounds, but not, but not uh, word meanings or semantics or concepts. Th those were stored elsewhere. And so we know that is the case now. I mean, concepts are represented all, all over the brain, both hemispheres. And so that was, Okay. That was a, a revelation, and you know, even uh, and and that paper that I mentioned before by Demene kind of illustrated that was was I think the first paper to really show that in a task activation study, which was his was PET, obviously, but doesn't matter. Yeah. We now know that this little region in the back of the superior temporal gyrus is actually more involved in speech production than speech comprehension, and so that's been a huh difficult for some folks to accept. Um, it fits into the Hickok and Popple dorsal and ventral language stream framework very nicely. Yes. It's like the first stage of the dorsal processing stream, but it's more about activating internal representations of, of speech sounds before you before you produce them. It's okay. Phonolo yeah. Phonological access, phonological retrieval, whatever you want to call it. Yes. But that's, you know, that process is not very important for comprehension. It might, yeah. it might help a little bit, especially if you're comprehending sentences and the sentences are kind of maybe a little unfamiliar to you and uh, unexpected, the word stream. And so you have to keep the words in a, a little buffer while you're processing the overall meaning of the sentence. You know, that, that region might play a little role in that kind of uh, short-term memory process, but for the most part, it you can damage it, you know, and that's another th thing that we've learned over the years is that you can produce focal damage in that region. It doesn't affect comprehension at all. Interesting. Oh, that's interesting. So, so that's actually right. I mean, um, sort of illustrates a the difference between lesion studies and and mapping studies. I mean, it's interesting because I, I you would have thought that because of that effect, people would have tried to revise their right. their thought. Um, right. But yep. When I first started writing about this topic, you know, mid '90s, maybe we published a paper in Brain that looked at a region focused on a region called the planum temporale, which is yep. this, it's not equivalent to Wernicke's, the classic Wernicke's area. I mean, I, I shouldn't use that term because, and people have been lately advocating that we not use that term anymore. And I, I agree with that. Wernicke's the, the, the Wernicke's or the planum temporale? The Wernicke's area. No, okay. planum temporale is fine. That's an anatomical description. <laughs> yeah. Wernicke's area is this like conceptual construct almost, but I just 
I'll refer you to the Wikipedia entry on Wernicke's area. I'm, I'm using that definition. They have a picture of it and it's posterior SDG and super marginal gyrus, but yes, um, planum temporale is part of that yeah. wider region. But anyway, the planum temporale was for years, you know, going back to the 1940s, it was recognized that it was longer on the left side of the brain than the right side. And so a lot of people attached a lot of importance to that. Norman Geshwin in particular, but uh, yes. you know there, that was supposed to be the substrate for language lateralization. Even though you know it's obvious that ninety-five percent of people who are right-handed are left hemisphere dominant for language. We know, we knew that from lesion studies and WADA studies, but but only about two-thirds of them have longer planum temporale. So how do you explain the other? people who are left dominant, but anyway. Yeah, well, um, and then also you have the open question of uh, uh, whether the, you know, the, the observed larger plane of temporality is, is larger because of use or yeah. larger because of genetics, and then it therefore is used. Or, or larger for no reason, you know, nothing, yeah. no reason related to language at all. I mean, yes. Which was what we argued in that, that brain paper it was 96, I think it was. But anyway, um, yeah, we, we were interested in that topic and uh, I lost the point that I was going to make. But anyway, um, <coughs> there were there were there were big revelations along the way. Another yeah. one I would say is the whole uh, default mode phenomenon, the whole task induced deactivation phenomenon. That, yeah, that, so if I could just pause for a second there, that that actually yeah. let's get into talking about that, because. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually a really important point to bring up is that I feel that you were right there at the very beginning in, in showing the first results, along with Rachel and, and, and a few other people of, yeah, of the deactivation. The Wash U folks. Were the Wash U folks. Hugely right, with working. Kristen McKenna, I, I believe. Uh, yeah, so and that was... Shulman. And yeah, well, well Shulman and, 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 and Rachel, and, and, but your first author was... Uh, McKernan, McKernan. Oh, McKernan. Chris. Yeah, McKernan. McKernan yep. A poster. Yeah, and I remember seeing that. I remember seeing that poster presented, and and I thought this is a really nice study in which you actually increase the task difficulty and then showed mm -hmm. corresponding uh, uh, off turning off yeah. you know, a, a, a gradation of that of the default mode network. But yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you. But oh, no, that's go okay. on. No, that that's was great. wonderful work uh, as well, and that oh, was thanks. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's been a. Uh, Interesting, yeah, obviously, uh, the, the interest in the default mode network can't be overstated. I mean, it's, but it was, it was just kind of unexpected that you would get decreases in the bold signal and decreases in PET signals um, when in certain parts of the brain when you do a task. I mean, why, why, why yeah. did it happen? That was a that was a complete mystery. So we put forward the hypothesis, tested the hypothesis in that 1999 paper in Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience on concept processing during the resting state. That was a really hard paper for me to write. I had to stew over those data for several years and uh, try to relate it to the literature. And I discovered all this literature on mind wandering, you know, that stretch, stretches back to William James, but uh, got got ignored after that, or not not experimentally uh, studied, right? Because it was of no interest to the behaviorists what was going on in your mind when you were resting. Yeah, um, and it took until the 1960s when a group of people started behaviorally studying it. But that so that was a really amazing literature to discover. It it really had been ignored. I mean, it's it was this kind of like a cult, <laughs> a cult literature. Um, interesting. A connoisseur's literature that uh, was really interesting, but you know, it, and it and it kind of uh, intersects with behavioral studies of depression and rumination and stuff like that. And a lot of these people that were doing the work were psychiatrists. Yes. Anyway, um, so the hypothesis was that the brain when it's not distracted by anything in the external environment, uses just does stuff with internally stored conceptual knowledge. Why yes. not? I mean, that's how we plan what we're gonna do. 
you, you're, you're not going to plan the future, your immediate or long-term future, whatever, uh, while you're doing a video game. Um, yep. You have to wait until you get a quiet period, and you know you can you can focus on retrieving knowledge about the world, which is what you need in order to make cogent, you know, workable plans for the future. That so planning the future is a big part of it, but also digesting previous experiences. You know, trying to make sense of things that have happened to you or things that you've seen, heard, whatever uh, things people have said to you. Um, and th those are things you can't, you, you just can't do when your when your brain is occupied with an external stream of stimulus or some, you know, that you have to yeah. deal with. It's like yeah. I can't deal, um, so I have to deal with external stimulus. So I'm going to shut down this uh, network in the brain that does this. You know, let's just call it yeah. what it is. It's conceptual processing, and uh, I'm, I, I arrived at that term, or decide picked that term for that paper after considering lots of different terms, and I'm sticking with it. Um, in my lab, we don't call this network the default mode network. We call it the conceptual network. Really, really. Yeah. Oh yeah. So because, it's not okay because that's what it is. Yeah. No, that's so why don't we it does. I yeah mean, why don't we yeah. it uses conceptual knowledge for many many different purposes like all the ones i mentioned uh future planning uh also called prospection uh retrieval of autobiographical information retrieval of episodic uh, memory i mean self-processing you name it social processing uh uh theory of mind it's all the same network, different parts of it are differentially engaged in, in different kinds of knowledge. Yes. Um, based on just, well, we don't know what the basis of that is. Like, like I believe that parts of the medial prefrontal cortex are more involved in processing self knowledge okay. than they are okay. in processing knowledge about non non self related topics but why why is that i mean so I, so I what makes really you have, say that though we don't what really evidence? have any idea oh there's i think there's pretty good imaging evidence for that okay okay I don't, I don't know of any lesion evidence for that but i think the the imaging evidence is pretty strong i don't i don't really yeah. follow that yeah literature much but you know there uh, this theory of mind is another interesting type of knowledge that we have like we we have stories of knowledge about how people are likely to behave in certain situations and what is likely to be going through their minds at the time. So and, you think that, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it start, it's, it's knowledge that we, no, I don't think it's uh, genetic. It's knowledge that we start to acquire as infants. And, you know, we recognize that people respond in certain ways in certain situations. We, for example, if, if you're an infant and you, say mama you know you know that your mother is going to come to you that's because it's happened before um, yeah uh, and that's a really simple example but that's the same sort of mechanism that helps us figure out that you know if, if somebody says something to somebody else that somebody else might get angry about what that person said and we under we can intuitively know that the the anger might be there and we can understand it and we can explain it, you know? So that's the kind of thing that people mean when they say theory of mind. And I think there are parts of the conceptual network that are maybe uh, more involved in that process than other parts of the network. But uh, I, would, I would still, you know, characterize the whole thing as the conceptual network because what I mean by that is uh, it, stores and retrieves and manipulates and combines and whatever knowledge that we've gained across our lifespan through through experience and that, and that can explain also why you know for instance even mice you know you map out default mode network uh, areas in mice that's they still have you know so the yeah. self-related experiences of the world 
and yeah. that's where they really relate they know it. they know where the food is likely to be and what animals are dangerous now some of that could be uh, is is surely ingrained i mean yeah. uh, not ingrained hardwired genetically yeah. coded a, a, a mouse has to know that they're predators and and what recognize them they they can't be learning that from experience or from mouse talk yeah yeah uh, you know. um but let me just ask uh, really quickly let's go back to the, your first paper on this to the degree that any of those tasks engage i mean you can imagine engaging some sort of self-referential uh concept processing even during those tasks to some degree mm-hmm. and but but that, but definitely not as much and, and that's what you're trying to say is that yeah yeah, yeah that was that was the basis of that 99 paper on conscious resting yeah. state was a comparison of a task that had nothing to do with concepts, you know, just monitoring tones in the external environment, which Kristen McKiernan uh, yes. used later in her parametric study also. And, yeah. um, you know, that, that should, if it's difficult enough anyway, should um, sort of uh, express that shut yeah. down. Yeah. Shut down the conceptual system. Uh, from yeah. a normal mind wandering state, um, but but uh, semantic tasks, you know, with words, um, activate or engage that concept system. So when you compare the resting state to the the non semantic uh, condition, you should see deactivation. Yeah. Uh, during yeah. non semantic, but not so much during the semantic task, and and that's what we saw. Yeah. But others have refuted, uh, you know, uh, presented contrary evidence. Um, I, I can I continue to see that pattern in our data. The resting okay. state is not. I mean, there's. I think there are still folks out there that think of the resting state as sort of this somehow quiescent state in the brain where there's, you know, the neural spiking goes down to zero or something like that it's obviously not the yeah case. it's not at all true it's just um, not... yeah yeah so i continue to see um if if we compare semantic conditions to the resting state you know you get a completely different activation pattern than if you compare semantic states to non-semantic tasks okay, okay. And that's important for pre-surgical brain mapping because that's yeah. all about th- those studies are all about sensitivity and specificity. Specificity referring to I- activating areas of the brain that correspond to the uh, process that you're concerned about, whatever that yeah. might be. Right, as opposed, yeah. Okay, so so let me let me just plow forward into you have you have two recent papers that caught my eye. One is I believe still in bioarchive. Yeah, uh, but might not be. But okay, so it's still in bioarchive. Um, Under review, we're we're pushing out the what we hope final revision. The, the editors there have been sending it every time we put in a revision, they add another reviewer to the process. So it's, yeah, that's you know. uh, yeah. But but one thing interesting that caught my eye about that. Well, first of all, both of these papers. There's the, your other paper, your recent one in PNAS in in 2022 that, that recently came out. They both are really sort of a, a, an innovation in my, in my opinion on, on the sort of the, you know, you use representational similarity analysis as opposed to just sort of task attraction mm-hmm. and, and you do hierarchical clustering of this, mm-hmm. which I think is really powerful in, in many contexts. And mm-hmm. so, but what you found, I mean, so it's, you can talk more about what you found, but, but one sentence popped out though, you mentioned that, that the results that you found in terms of testing uh, this, uh, you know, distributed network for concepts is that that the information streams originating. So the the idea is that the the calls into question the idea that there's localized hubs for concept representation that they're more distributed mm-hmm. throughout the brain. Um, yeah. And I'm I'm wondering if that's sort of a, how does that fit with what you were saying before as far as the. Uh, default mode network. um, Yeah, I wish I understood this network better than I do. um, I mean, that's good. We have lots of work to do ahead of us. But so one one idea is that the anterior temporal lobe is a hub for semantic concepts um, representation. Um, And what that what that means? Well, what I think it means, I I don't adhere to that model, um, which is pretty obvious from our work. But 
what what I think it means is that the various um, modality specific processing systems in the brain, and there are lots of them, lots lots more than you know we usually think of, and and it depends on what you think of as a modality. Like I, I think of space as kind of a modality of processing, like spatial awareness, yeah. spatial cognition, and temporal cognition. But you know, those are those are obviously representations that are derived from more primitive sensory modalities and, and motor action uh, systems. But uh, anyway, those sort of, let, let's just call them modality related systems feed in, somehow feed into the uh, anterior temporal lobe and uh, combine somehow. I, I didn't mean feed in, they, they combine somehow and create a representation in the ATL that is not modality specific. Okay. And what, what that means is different to different people who are, you know, even different people who adhere to this model will give different explanations of what those ATL representations are supposed to be like. Are they, are they just symbols? Are they amodal? Are they totally abstract and devoid of any experiential kinds of modality information? Or are they they more like conjunctions of different modalities. Um, I mean, there are different theories about it and uh, not very many um, detailed quantitative modeling models that we can yeah. deal to. Yeah. Um, there are some and, and though, like the model that Tim Rogers and Jay McClellan made and that, um, uh, Matt Lamb and Ralph's group is continuing to develop, and, and uh, those are that's great work. I mean, that's what we need in this field to address. I don't know if you're familiar with David Marr's levels of analysis yes. at the the uh, algorithmic level, which is missing in a lot of the work that's that's done. Um, I think that that should be the, the main contribution of to the algorithmic level of analysis is gonna be the use of uh, brain-like neural network models. And uh, I'd love to see more of that kind of work being done. It's so just, kind of, yeah. it's just difficult work. Anyway, I, I wanna get back to your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what, I will, we'll, we'll, we'll flag that though, because I wanna go back to that point, um, but yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I, I don't think that that's, that 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 model of uh, everything feeding into the ATL doesn't seem to be well supported by the the RSA studies that we're doing. They they uh, highlight, and it almost doesn't matter what kind of analysis you do or what kind of semantic model you do. I mean, we've looked at you know from the PNAS paper that we looked at uh, category models. We looked at taxonomic models based on a thing called WordNet. We looked at uh, distributional models like word to vec and glove and things like that and yes. they all they all give you know kind of similar results which is that a lot of the conceptual network not just the atl but a lot of it the angular gyrus and ventral temporal regions and prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate and precuneus and medial prefrontal cortex all of it encode seems to encode information about the semantic structure of, you know, in this case, groups of about 300 lexical concepts. And there's- But you found, you found that the experiential, yeah. The, yeah, we, the experiential. Haven't, we haven't seen anything special about the ATL. So, so I think of it more as a broadly distributed high level association cortex that's in a lot of different regions of the brain. So in that PNAS paper, you, 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 know, you found that the best model, and this was really intriguing, and this sort of leads into potentially David Marr's uh, uh, sort of statements, and because and, it sort of drives how you think of the, how the brain organizes, uh, you know, how it does this com computation at a, at a very low level. And, and you found that there's the experiential, the experiential model, so things that are tied in with the modality in which they come in, in some yeah. sense, are, is, is pretty much, by far, the strongest uh, uh, correlates the strongest with with this these concept representations. Right. Yep. 
and, and what are the implications of that? And also, does it sort of suggest that like this, you know, our brains really are kind of this, you know, sure we have modules, but I mean, it's sort of like this, this, uh, this loose associative network that sort of, you know, everything sort of comes, you know, is grounded in experience and, and, and with enough experiences might become abstracted to some degree, but it's really grounded in your experience in some sense. I don't know if you want to talk yeah. about that. Well, that's, that's where the lab is in the theoretical space, um, which is not at all an invention of ours. Obviously, yeah. this goes back to Wernicke and maybe back to David Hume and, you know, uh, Aristotle, I don't know. Um, it's not a new idea that uh, you learn about concepts through experience and you generalize those experiences into sort of more abstract schematic representations. But that's that seems to be well supported from our data. The right, the uh, the experiential representation is uh, well. We can we can talk about it if you want. But we we published that as a big paper in 2016 in cognitive neuropsychology, and I think it's I think it's starting to have some influence on people. It, it doesn't doesn't satisfy everybody's um, uh, notion. Uh, a priori notion of what a semantic model should be like. So we called it a brain-based semantic model, you know, which it, it really is. It doesn't, there's, there's nothing like, you know, we think of what's a bird? Well, a bird has wings. Well, there's nothing like that in the model. Right. There's no features like that. And so yeah. if that's the level of explanation, if that's the conceptual framework that you need to explain how we know what a bird is, then this model is not going to really satisfy it. But, but what it tries to do is figure out what the mechanism is, the algorithmic mechanism uh, for how uh, concepts are acquired and represented in the brain. Yes. Like, you know, uh, there might be a tile on the brain that is, you know, specialized for coyotes or something like that. But why? Yeah. Why yeah. is that tile specialized for coyotes or ungulates or whatever you know the category is that you uh, put the stimulus into? And uh, you know that's that's kind of what we're interested in. And, and you know why, in my opinion, well, at least at this stage in our understanding, if you can explain uh, why a certain concept uh, is represented in this certain way across the brain, if you can actually explain it in terms of experiential phenomena, I think that's a pretty good explanation for why yeah. for now, for now, that's that's good enough. I mean, so that's what we're trying to get at. The model uh, is brain-based in the sense that it looks at 64, 65 um, experiential types. You yep. know, the, the, so that's not just five senses, I mean, the yeah. visual sense can be broken down into color, shape, motion, spatial, whatever. And uh, likewise, the tactile sensation uh, modality, the somatosensory modality has many different kinds of different kinds of features, temperature, pain, shape, uh, yeah. texture, weight. Um, and there also are emotional experiences that people have and yep. cognitive experiences. So that's... Yes. That's where we dive off the deep end a little bit in this model. We say that, you know, your, for example, your experience of needing something is a valid kind of modality of experience. Yeah, and yeah. That's in there too. And, um, the reason for generating models like this, representational models, is so that you can have a sort of understanding of the results that is not completely data driven. Yes. Now, if you do data driven, purely data driven analyses, and you know, uh, uh, reduce the dimensionality of the data with PCA or whatever, you're going to be left with some some challenges interpreting what what those what those components actually mean. And, yes. Uh, yes. You know, when they when they don't form a very coherent story, you're you're kind of it's it's not it's not contributing much 
Yeah. So, yeah. so this is not a data-driven approach that my lab is taking. It's a very, very model, model-based approach. So the model so, is the the experiential components of yeah. this, and 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 the implications. Uh, once again, going a little bit back to mechanisms, uh, is the idea that you know it's. But it's interesting because you have. You have you still the brain's still modules, but at the same time, it seems like the the concepts, as they're processed in these, these these hubs, in some sense, are this collection of of associated experiences of some sort uh, that sort of make that concept, and it sort of seems very organic in that regard. There's no taxonomy that's you know that we like to imply. It's sort of it's sort of a bottom up sort of yeah. organization of the world. Right, the taxonomies. Um, you know, in the traditional sense, like what's a butterfly, what's a yeah cockroach, um, are emergent from the experiential. Right, right. And so what it is. Yeah. And when, so I was reading your papers, I, I actually, I kept on thinking of, of Jack Lance's uh, work in which he was having, you know, he had these naturalistic stimuli, listening to stories and finding the semantic representation and finding it literally you know, it seems like it overlaps a lot with your distributed, you know, it's like literally everywhere in the brain, you have these sort of semantic trees. And it sort of suggests that, yeah, the brain is sort of modular, but at the same time, it, uh, all these semantic representations are very much distributed. Um, to, how, does that fit very well with Jack's work or? or yeah, um, I think the, the, the results, you know, the images that you get from all the data massaging and complicated analyses, they, <clears throat> even though his approach is completely data-driven and ours is model-driven, it's amazing how similar the maps look at the end. <clears throat> but um, yeah, yeah. So the the uh, I think our studies and and their studies and Alex Huth is the I think the main yes. driver in that work. Yeah. Um, and I should should say that the the person leading the work in our lab is Leo Fernandino, who I really want to give a shout out to because he's one of those guys, an example of somebody who's much smarter than I am. And he's been leading this work and was the first author on that PNAS paper. And none of none of this would have been possible without his contributions. Yes. Um, they our work in the Berkeley group, uh, the Berkeley Austin group, whatever it is now, yeah. uh, agree in terms of the spatial, the anatomy of the of the system. For sure. Yes, and there does seem to be a sort of a dis, this sort of distinction between the the areas of the of the of the network that are located along the near the STS or middle temporal gyrus, uh, and 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 other regions that are I don't they're, they're behaving a little bit differently, and I don't I don't have a good characterization of that we're looking at uh, another study that. Tony Tong, who is the first author on that bioarchive <clears throat> paper we're trying to get accepted. Yeah. He's also been looking at event concepts compared to object concepts, which yep. is a basic ontological distinction that uh, everybody recognizes. Uh, your, your, your concept of a hammer is not, you know, you can't say how long is, how long does that hammer last or you know, right. what, what happened? A hammer, you know, it's, you can say what happened A party, you can say a party lasts for a certain duration of time, but objects and events are, uh, they have different experiential properties. So he's looking at that and it seems like this, this strip along the STS MTG is, is much more interested in events than objects, but we're trying to understand exactly why that is. Interesting, interesting. Do you think that going to, so, so as I sort of try to tie this up, as far as where you're going to go with this, do you think that going to, I mean, it, it seems like, I mean, uh, you know, my, I'm always trying to think of ways of, of applying uh, layer fMRI uh, to this type of thing. I mean, it seems that uh, yeah. uh, it might lend it, lend some, shed some light on this. Absolutely. You should start looking at the, uh, you know, what you can get from layer fMRI is you can test models of the directionality of information flow a little yep. bit, right? I mean, yeah. we try to do that with MEG too, but that's another topic. 
Um, <laughs> okay. You know, Granger causality and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If, uh, if you could look at different, well, just the conceptual network and use layer fMRI to understand better how information flows around that network and between right. between nodes of that network and earlier lower level systems that would be cool. yeah exactly exactly so so finally to tie this in with um so i mean and this is sort of an open-ended question and uh, more philosophical i guess you know going back to david Marr as far as you know so what how do you think that the brain does encoding i mean as far as at the neuronal level uh, what do you actually think uh, is happening? Is it, you know, I mean, uh, you know, certainly you can get, you can go ever higher resolution. You can maybe draw output input inferences from brain mapping. And, and I think that what's really nice about your maps is that it's not only cartography. It's like your, your, your maps strongly suggest mechanisms that might be able to be tested, but probably are beyond the realm of testing with fMRI to some degree, because it's, you know, what's actually happening neuronally um, at the, you know, what, you know, is it, is it, you know, and, and actually that's obviously other questions of expectation, inhibition, you know, uh, you know, attractor states that are set up in some regard. So how far can you take uh, what you're doing with fMRI and where do you have to sort of bridge this gap between, you know, models, computational mm -hmm. models or, or neuronal models? Mm -hmm. Of, of what's actually the mechanisms? That's a tough question. Yeah. You know, I, I want to say that uh, the criticism of brain mapping is just cartography is a little, a little overdone. It's yep. a little tired at this point. Um, yeah. I think cartography is one piece of understanding brain mechanisms. And I think that people who deny that, that's, that to me is good evidence that they just aren't interested in the brain at all. You know, it, it's true that knowing that, you know, comp, uh, the conceptual system is widely distributed instead of being in the posterior superior temporal gyre, uh, doesn't tell you much about how comprehension occurs, but it tells you a little bit. Yeah. I mean, um, and, you know, we can, we can leave aside all the obvious points about how important that sort of thing is if you're a neurosurgeon right yeah but i think even 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 pure cartography which i don't think my lab does uh, we always like are testing some processing related hypothesis but even pure cartography like not hypothesis driven is is somewhat valuable but i think the criticism is overdone because there there really isn't that much pure cartography out there like everybody these days starts with some kind of processing model some kind of uh algorithmic model it yeah. might be very simple um you know it it might not qualify as earth shaking but there's there's usually some reason why the tasks are set up the way they are. Um, yeah. You know, like we did a study of the visual word form area and uh, which I like a lot by uh, Tino Mano was the first author. Um, and we compared different hypotheses about what the visual word form area does and did task manipulations, like had people doing a completely non-phonological task while they process these visual stimuli compared to naming them which is a, obviously a phonological task. And the activation patterns in the BWFA just change completely based on this task manipulation and sort of interacted in complex ways with the stimulus properties. And so it enabled us to uh, test a, a hypothesis. A, it's a general one. It's not a very specific one that, that the VWFA is a, is a link between vision and phonology and vision and audition yes uh, it's a yeah. it's maybe weighted to, more toward the visual side but it's uh uh clearly driven by phonological top-down phonological inputs as well and that yeah. sort of thing you know it's it's not cartography at all right because we already knew where the visual word form area yeah was. it's testing. testing the engagement of it yeah. it's very very specific tasks right and 
I think most fMRI these days is like that. So I yeah, I don't know where the criticism comes from. I think it comes from people who, as I said, just don't understand why all these people are so interested in the brain. Yeah, well, I also think that people, yeah, but I also think that people feel like, okay, so what, what the real mystery is, I mean, there's many levels of the mystery and, and, and the, is, you know, how, how, you know, sets of neurons, uh, you know, what, what does it even mean? Yeah, you know, we know neurons fire, yeah. we know they, they either excite or inhibit, we know that they're connected in some way. And, and we know there's maps, but somehow that, that kind they feel like somehow, and it's still a mystery, obviously, um, what, what's actually going on there? And, and I think so. Yeah. I think it's one of those questions I will pass over in silence as yeah. somebody said Wittgenstein or somebody. Um, yeah. It's, you're talking about consciousness in a way or? Well, I mean, I think that in terms of just simply, uh, you know, you, you have spatial locations, you have areas that are modulated, you have, you have your models of, 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 you know, areas that are activated with very specific uh, manipulations. So you understand pretty well how they're talking to each other and what's going mm -hmm. on, but you, but you don't, at some level, people might argue that, well, we don't, we'd like to build a brain. If it's ultimately yes. we would like to build brains. Yep. That's my um, goal. Yep. Yeah. So then we need to actually know um, what the, you know, what actually is going on at, at the, at the, you know, it seems like the, at the level of layers and columns and yeah. and neurons sort of, you know, what, what does a concept mean in terms of mm -hmm. neuronal ensembles? No, that's a great question. And obviously one that a lot of people are interested in. Yeah. Um, yeah so uh, I think that conscious awareness depends on um, a resonating or active um, neural pattern that persists yeah. for a certain minimal period of time. Um, and that the kinds of, and that different areas of the brain represent different kinds of information. And that's, that's you know, that's obvious. Uh, I don't know if it's profound in any way, but it's, uh, that's, that would be the starting point of building the brain. Yeah. So you would yeah. have to, you would have to build it. Well, a, a brain isn't going to exist without uh, sensory and inputs and motor outputs. So it has to be a real embodied brain. But if yeah. it is that way, then <clears throat> because of the location of the incoming sensory streams and how they're combined, that will naturally lead to sort of self, these self-organizing maps that differentially represent different kinds of information in yeah. the system. So, but, you know, will this embodied uh, silicon-based uh, artificial brain uh, have consciousness? I don't know. Yeah, that's another question altogether, the, the neural mechanism of consciousness. Uh, you know, there's some, I mean, I think it's, I think, I think a lot of it's sub, ultimately subcortical and that it's sort of the cortex is sort of like this, it feeds back into, um, but anyway, that's just another, that's another topic altogether. <laughs> uh, alertness and awakeness are definitely subcortical. Yeah. 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 Or, or, and even cortex. homeostatic functions of yeah. hunger, the most basic ones, but then you can build it all the way up to, you know, desiring things. and Right. Uh, right. Like why that. does why does squirting dopamine in certain neural networks cause a pleasant feeling? Yeah, yeah, right. and and who knows? It might be that that might be the mechanism of of solidifying networks. You know, yeah. squirting yeah. dopamine, and then they all then they start firing together, and so it's a reinforcement. But uh, but yeah, so there's mechanisms like that that mm -hmm. I think I think that that bridge is becoming less and less, and I think it's actually finally there, there's there's points of contact between. Mm -hmm those mechanisms and, and that, but, so let me just finish, you know, we're, we're over an hour here, but I, I just want to keep you a little bit longer because you've also worked a lot. I mean, obviously you're a clinician and, and one thing I care about very much is um, clinical applications of, of functional MRI. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's different lines you can go. And right now it's being used for pre-surgical mapping, very basic, very rare, but it's there. And, you know, people want to, you know, people are building these big databases so that they can come up with biomarkers for psychiatric. Uh, I'm not sure how successful that will be, but, um, but I also think that one thing that you've thought of a lot is the practical nuts and bolts 
sort of, you know, what will it take to actually have, you know, in a scanner, uh, in a scan room, like have a technician click, a, push a button, just like without any other MRI and have, you know, functional MRI come up that's usable and interpretable enough to be used in, in pre-surgical mapping in an efficient way that it can actually be used more often and disseminated. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Because that's, I really think I'm really trying to push fMRI to be more clinical as far as that's concerned. And maybe maybe it'll be beyond pre-surgical mapping as well. So yeah. Well, pre-surgical mapping with fMRI is being widely done, actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what widely means in that sense. I would guess there are a hundred centers in the US that are doing it on a well, pretty good regular basis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. we do it on a regular basis, not often because there aren't that many patients and and I don't I don't do the so at our center it's there's no logical reason for it but my team does the epilepsy pre-surgical mapping and a different team does the pre-surgical mapping for brain tumors okay um, which is fine because the the brain tumor cases are more urgent and more disruptive to your life so that's fine with me um, but yeah we do you know two or three epilepsy pre-surgical mapping cases a month uh, and do it on a regular basis. And we have a pipeline that the data goes into and I generate a report and goes in the medical record and all that stuff. So, okay. uh, I, and I think we've made a big difference because, you know, uh, one, one obvious thing is that we're not doing WADA tests anymore at MCW. And when it's I- It's better than a WADA test. Yeah, I can't, when I came, it was all, WADA testing, and they would do a couple WADA tests every month. And it's not that that's a bad test; it's kind of crude and almost barbaric. But it's, uh, you know, it's not that dangerous. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's more expensive, more manpower involved. It's, uh, a, uh, it's not quite as accurate at predicting outcomes in our hands, at least as fMRI. So that might be a minor benefit, but mostly it's just, yeah, safer and fMRI is safer and cheaper and um, can be repeated. So it's got a lot of advantages and it gives, it also gives, you know, we use it mainly for predicting risk of surgery, but it can also be used to generate activation maps that can yep. influence where the surgeon uh, does his approach and or her approach and what what they what they decide to leave in versus take out. I yeah I don't think you know we the the problems there and we've been talking about this as you know with the OHBM committee that's writing yes. up uh, guidelines. Uh, the problem is sensitivity and specificity. So is your is the protocol that you're using sensitive for detecting the process? that you are trying to detect and is it specific to that process? So, you know, if you are using a resting state baseline, let's use that as an example, you're unlikely to detect any of the con conceptual network in your activation map. Yep. Um, because it's all being subtracted out. And so if somebody's using a protocol like that and saying, well, yeah, the, nothing in the anterior temporal lobe lit up in this person. Go ahead, take it out. And the, the anterior temporal lobe is a common site for surgery because a lot of epilepsy foci are there in yeah. the anterior hippocampus or amygdala or anterior temporal neocortex. So it became a standard uh, epilepsy surgery to take out the anterior third or so of the temporal lobe. Um, and it's hard to activate that area with fMRI. Yeah. I mean, you have, to, you have to use certain kinds of protocols and you can't use a resting state baseline yeah. because that area is active a lot during rest. And, uh, you know, there's susceptibility problems and um, signal dropout problems, distortions. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a little challenging, but that's the sensitivity problem. The specificity problem is, you know, well, what if you do uh, activate the traditional Wernicke's area with a, with a stream of auditory sentences? Does that, does that mean that it's uh, necessary for comprehension just because 
you had the subject in the scanner listening to auditory spoken sentences and that activated the region? Probably not. I mean, because if you look at your map, the uh, auditory regions in the right hemisphere also were activated. So um, lesioning, nobody wants to lesion the posterior superior temporal gyrus, but I can almost guarantee a surgeon that if they were to do that, it wouldn't affect the person's comprehension. It might affect their, uh, might, might make them kind of paraphasic for a while. But. Yeah. So, so in that case, it's a specificity problem because the activation pattern that you're looking at from that paradigm is not really about language comprehension. It's more about auditory perception. I'm trying to illustrate that the problem of using the maps and telling the surgeon to look at the maps and guide their scalpel based on the, on the activation maps is problematic Yeah. at this point. It's, uh, there's, not, there's, there's not enough evidence. In fact, there's hardly any that doing so makes the outcomes better. Interesting, okay. And, the, and I, my gut feeling is that some protocols would probably make the outcome worse. Okay, okay. <laughs> you, you were to do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're right, it's, 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 so that's interesting. So it's just simply, um, it's useful in terms of looking at, you know, which hemisphere is dominant. And, yeah. But beyond that, well, mapping that's really important. get you into trouble. In epilepsy, that's really important because yeah. those, those, those uh, surgeries are a little bit more elective. And so yeah. the, the physicians and the patient are trying to decide whether the surgery is on the whole a good thing or more likely to not be a good thing. So they're weighing risks and benefits. And so if we can tell them what the risk is that they will become a nomic or lose their memory. Got it. Got it. That's, That's interesting. Okay. That's what okay. the WADA test was for. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see any, so where do you see progress in, in clinical applications of fMRI? I mean, is it, is it more getting the maps better and more interpretable or getting the methodology better so that, you know, the, I guess that would come once the, the need arises, but, or is it, you know, many other people are trying to do, you know, psychiatric, uh, assessment in some sense or prediction or, or with, with fMRI, where yeah. do you see that in some sense? Uh, I don't know. I don't follow that literature very well, but um, a apart from the epilepsy literature. So I don't know, but, uh, you know, I think it can be used for diagnosis, maybe. Um, maybe there are neural patterns that are subtle and pick up, you know, uh, especially in the psychiatric field, but this is way outside my area of expertise. Yeah. I'll take yeah. a grain of salt. But, you know, the diagnostic categories in psychiatry are a little fuzzier yeah. than in neurology. Um, and so if there are neural patterns that can, and, uh, you know, some of the psychiatric uh, conditions like schizophrenia, for example, probably have multiple subtypes. Yes. And so if there is anything that can be gained, and maybe those subtypes respond differentially to different kinds of medications. So, yeah. but that's where it has to go. It has to go through that whole validation, you know, chain of having a, identifying subtypes behaviorally, identifying a neural signature of them, <clears throat> showing that, you know, it makes a difference. Yeah. What the neural... Yeah. So, subtype is, you know, does it actually make a difference in the clinical management of the patient or not? And that's, I think we've kind of shown that with the epilepsy pre-surgical mapping stuff, but you know, there, there are subtypes of dyslexia, pretty clear. Do they have neural signature subtypes? Do they correspond to anything? It's not known yet. Um, would you, if you knew what the neural subtype of dyslexia was, would you treat the patient differently and use a different kind of rehab Interesting. therapy? Yeah. Maybe, but that's, it, it's very possible that things like that could be developed, but yeah, it's, it, yeah. you're right. You're right. In a lot of areas, despite a lot of work, despite a lot of preliminary work, we haven't gotten through that whole validation process for most yeah. most of the applications. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems like right that 
future work that needs to be done as far, but it, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because it seems that there are neural correlates of yeah, a lot yeah. of these things. That I mean, we're working on uh, aphasia quite a lot these days because your audience may, may appreciate that Bruce Willis is not the only person with aphasia <laughs> or uh, Gabby Gifford. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'll just, this is my pitch. Uh, there's, there's lots of people with aphasia. Um, it's a very common disorder. It's like 10 times more common than Parkinson's disease. Wow. And wow. multiple sclerosis and cerebral palsy and all these illnesses that you the public knows about, but they don't know about aphasia. That it's, it's very remarkable. I mean, Interesting. aphasia, stroke is the most common <clears throat> neurological cause of disability, long-term disability, um, more than anything else. And uh, aphasia occurs in about 25% of people with stroke. So <clears throat> it's really prevalent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a really devastating condition for a lot of people. They can't go back to work. They can't communicate with friends and family very well. And, you know, it's just a horrific condition. Yeah. So um, I wish the NIH would s support research on it more. We are, so our group is really getting heavily involved in research on aphasia and we're doing uh, functional connectivity studies before and after a two-week course of intensive therapy with um, transcranial electrical stimulation and so uh, I was going to ask about that they were yeah, modulated. so if yeah. so it's it's an area where fMRI may play a big role because everybody's lesion is different yeah uh, it's not it's not a homogeneous group at all and so the the rehab strategies that you uh, try to use in a patient. And the and if you're doing electrical stimulation, the site of the electrical stimulation might depend a lot on what their, for example, their language networks look like before yes. you start the treatment. And yeah, yeah. so I, I, I see a, a big role for fMRI uh, in that arena, but yep. we're, we're just at the beginnings of developing you know, that, that validation uh, process. Yeah, and combined, right, with, with you know, TMS or other neuromodulation techniques, yep. who knows, focus ultrasound. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Transcranial alternating current stimulation, which is, the idea of that is to um, reinforce oscillations in, in certain parts of the brain, but. Yeah, it's very that's specific another, frequencies. That's another, at specific frequencies and phases, and that's another area where just a lot of research needs to be done. Yeah, I've actually been really intrigued by, I mean, along with neuromodulation techniques, I, my, I, my eyes were opened in terms of looking at uh, fMRI-based neurofeedback uh, mm. implicit. Like for instance, if you find networks that sort of you know, are firing together, you give, you give some sort of a positive response and it, there's no behavior, but mm -hmm. it sort of strengthens the correlation between networks. That's also potentially interesting yeah, as well. That's, that's uh, amazing work. And we're not doing any of that. I'm not too familiar with it, but yeah, it's amazing how much biofeedback can affect the brain uh, brain phenomena, brain yeah. activity. Yeah. And somebody should. Yeah, they're working on a couple of places, but, uh, but yeah. But this is great. So um, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, and Thank it you. really is. Thank you. <laughs> covered a lot. Uh, As I said before, Peter, you put people at ease very well. <laughs> and for, for a man of your remarkable achievements, you are an amazingly humble and down-to-earth guy. And I, <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate that. Well, well thanks. Thanks. And um, uh, so just a last question, uh, you know, is, and you sort of answered it throughout, um, you know, what, what excites you now? What's, what's your What's the directions you're going? What's what's most interesting to, to you as far as the future? I'm most excited about the aphasia therapy stuff that we're doing, diagnosis and, and therapy. Yeah, I'm these days, of, of course, that and the uh, studies we're doing in the conceptual network, and you know, they overlap a little, they interact a little bit. Um, I just think there are oceans of opportunity in terms of understanding the detailed neural mechanisms of aphasia recovery and how we can promote that um, 
mainly with electrical stimulation, but there might be other ways. And there might be, uh, this further down the line, but useful brain-computer interfaces that can be developed for people with more severe aphasia. I mean, I have some patients whose phonological system is completely gone because of the left middle cerebral artery stroke that they had there. Oh, man. Their yeah. posterior STG and supermarginal gyrus and all the frontal parietal operculum are all gone. The arcuate fasciculus is gone. So they they can look at a word. You know, these are examples of just remarkable dissociations in the brain that are uh, easily apparent. They can look at a word and they know what it means. And, you know, we can test that using uh, uh, ta tasks that don't require any spoken out, but just, you know, match two words on, on their similarity of meaning. And they can do that, but they cannot retrieve any phonology related to wow. them. They cannot read them aloud. They can't tell whether two words rhyme or not by looking wow. at them. And uh, their phonological system is gone. And so that means that in when they try to spontaneously speak, they can't retrieve any words. Yeah, um, there might be some automatic phrases that their right hemisphere is producing independently of the language system, but um, those people are really impaired. And um, you know, if we could develop a brain-computer interface that would speak for them, that would retrieve the phonology for them, that would just be an amazing thing. So uh, I'm not going to see that before the end of my career, but I but I hope to help lay some of the groundwork for something like that. Yeah, have you tried using uh, like it seems like music i mean it seems like when people are singing uh it seems like and, and i've heard anecdotal evidence that mm -hmm. it counteracts aphasia in some regard it seems like if you could sort of train mm -hmm. you know that yep. sort of mechanism uh, yep potentially. yep like there's a lot of evidence of people who stutter don't stutter when they sing for example yeah because they're the whole uh stuttering is a some kind of weird problem with timing and subcortical circuits and when you're singing, the music provides a, a meter and a metric, and you don't need to ge generate an internal uh, sequence. But uh, uh, speaking from point of ignorance, I don't really study that condition. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's well known that many people with really bad stutters don't stutter okay. when they sing. So, uh, and there's a thing in aphasia called melodic intonation therapy, which uh, ah. get, the get, get the person to sing and it um, at least gets something coming out of their mouth. And so they uh, retrain some of the circuits that um, are completely you know, quiet or unable to be activated by, by internal uh, programs. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. You, you have them sing along with a, a recording or something like that and, or sing happy birthday or, you know, simple songs that they know and 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 it does and it's used for people with really severe uh speech apraxia problems mo more motor speech problems yeah 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 um, okay i don't i don't think that would help with phonology much because phonology is uh it's probably the most specific thing that the language system does although some people would argue with me about that. You know, some, for some people, language is the same as syntax. You know, it's, syntax is the only thing that should really be called language. But I think the phonological retrieval mechanism is a very, it's a very strongly left lateralized system and it's very specific to communication. So, and uh, you know, you have to, you have to build it up over a lifetime. like. Why do you call dog a dog? Why yeah. isn't it called chien or uh, whatever? Um, yeah. Pale. yeah. Um, it's just an arbitrary collection of sound forms that label concepts for you. And yep. when that's damaged, it's really hard to. Yeah. 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 It's hard to re re substitute for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, this has been great. Um, yeah. Anyway, I could I could keep on talking all day with you, but uh, but I appreciate your time, and uh, and this was a, a yeah really a fun conversation. So, so thanks and best of luck. I really appreciate it. I I I I'm delighted to do it, and this was really fun. All right. Well, well, thank you. Thank you.
Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This week's episode was produced by Jeff Mensch and Stefania Asimopoulos. Thank you.